Hello and welcome back and it's time for another NAS review but let's be honest this is probably one of the biggest NAS reviews I'm going to do this year. In terms of popularity the Synology 4 Bay Plus series has always kind of been up there for the majority of users and although it's always lacked a lot of the top 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 power of some of the rack station series the previous generation's DS918 Plus was probably one of the most popular NASes they have ever produced and that was back in 2017 when that was about so when we first heard about this the DS920 plus we were getting excited about it we wanted to know what it could do what it can't do and ultimately does it serve as a valuable successor to that of the DS918 this is Robbie at NAS compares and we want to find out if this NAS is worth your data Right, so let's get it out of the way. Early doors, how is this unit here? Normally, you to get things here on the channel. I normally, you know, ask for samples from brands, or sometimes they might say, you know, do a little review for us on something. But this is one I've actually had to procure personally. This is the DS920 Plus, and currently, it is not available to buy pretty much anywhere in the world, apart from Japan and areas of Korea. I think there's a few other tiny regions that have got it as well. I say tiny, they're massive. Um, but we've had to arrange to get this um, shipped over to us from Japan just for this review. We've already done it with the DS220 Plus. And thanks for some help of some Reddit users. I've already posted a hardware review about this device because they were able to lend me um, some of their kit and answer some of my questions. But now it's time for this video review of the DS920. What is good? It's pretty much supersizing everything we saw in the 918 and by everything it's probably a bit of a bold statement let's reel that in a little bit it has improved over the 918 in a number of ways but there are ways that it is not improved that has definitely angered a few of you when we first looked at those pdfs but let's talk about the device for a little bit first what we're seeing here so the japanese retail box much like the uh, 220 plus is largely identical to that of the units we get here in the west it's the retail box We've got the DS920 Plus sticker there. If we bring that closer to camera, and again, you'll have to forgive me, that light is really fantastically aggressive there. Um, and the label gives you a bit of information about the hardware inside, the CPU, the memory, any kind of expandability, that sort of thing, and mention of the M2 NVMe base that we'll talk about later in the video. But a mistake I made in my video with the 220, it's worth revisiting now, is simply that I used to think that these brown boxes they come in was just the same damn box, and then they just stuck a bunch of labels on it to denote in the device, but it's actually distinctive. You look at the bottom there, it does mention the DS920 Plus there, and there's information on all sides that detail this distinct device. So it is a bit unfair of me to just say it's the same brown box, different label. The, um, and again, the device retails, there's no real confirmed Western price at the moment, but based on the 918 and the pricing trends that we've seen on the 420 and the 720, I think we're looking at around 550, maybe 600 at the very top, and that's inclusive of tax. But again, that is a vague price that still needs complete um, clarification at launch. On top of that, the device doesn't arrive pre-populated. For those that are new to Synology now, it's worth highlighting you will need to buy hard drive and SSD media, if depending on which one you want to use inside this device, you're going to have to buy that separately, and that is not inclusive of your price. Now, much like the reviews we've done for the recent 20 plus series of Synology, this video is going to run a little long. I know that now we're only three minutes into it so far, but I can tell right now if you look at the bar at the bottom, this must be a long video, and that's because the number of you, this is going to be your first NAS. Maybe you've been holding off, you were going to buy the 918, and you thought, mm, no, it's a little older for me, let's see what else they can bring out in the meantime, and you've been holding out for a device like this. So with that spirit in mind, much like the 220, 720, and the 420, I'm going to make these reviews cover everything in terms of software and hardware capabilities of these devices so a lot of this you may already know i apologize that there's repetition to the more regular subscribers but let's have a look what we get for our money if we have a look inside we've got the brown box as well and again lovely little design touches that i talk about before and i know you guys think i'm really laboring about the retail packaging but i think it tells you a lot about a brand and where the priorities and um, where the sensibilities lie sometimes. I mean, again, the label there, even everything from the handle basically screams slick synology. They've always kind of 
designed themselves around the Apple model, and it's very, very clear looking at this that that has continued. Um, one thing I will say that's bummed me out a little bit already, you see at the top there, we've got some nice partition boxes that should have, um, you know, just basically inside all the accessories and the cable with the NAS at the bottom. When I unboxed the Japanese DS220, it came with this, this Synology guide that for the setting the device up the first time, and it's pretty detailed about setting the device up for the first time in terms of DSM, software capabilities, network capabilities, and more. So I kind of hoped there'd be one in there. But again, that's something that's incredibly regionally specific, and you're probably not going to get that in your own uh, place of purchase. So if we have a look inside, we have got inside our first box, our mains cable, regional mains cable. And again, it will differ depending on where in the world you are. I'll pop that over there. Next, we've got the main box of accessories, a little heavy there. Inside, we've got our two 1GBE cables right there, and these are Cat5e for the 1GBE connections on the rear. Hold your horses, yes, 1GBE, we'll get to that later on, but there's two of them for two independent ports. Inside, we've also got screws for two and a half inch media, because three and a half inch media does not require a screwdriver for this device, but we'll go through that later on. On top of that, we have got our external PSU, and yes, an external PSU is a branded one as well, as you can see there. And that branded PSU, I'll talk about in just a second. We've got our keys for secure locking the hard drive bays there on the front, say hard drive, SSD as well. So these are keys that are same set of keys for all four locks, but it does allow you to secure the trays inside the device for uh, to prevent accidental removal. But I'm not gonna say there's a heavy duty like Yale or Chubb locks or something. These will, you can break it if you want, but this isn't to stop general theft because people can just take the whole box. It's mainly to stop people accidentally removing them. Uh, and finally, we've got our quick start and installation instructions right there that details how to set the device up for the first time, as well as information at uh, Synology's own website, where there's updated guides all the time. Probably better than a paper manual, but I'm still in love with that one that I've just put on the floor there. Um, and apart from that, the device also comes with three years of manufacturer's warranty, no matter where you are in the world. So that is all covered. Now... I said I was gonna to touch on the PSU. The reason I would touch on that in the same way I've talked about it in other videos is because I know there's an area of uh, disagreement with regards to PSUs like this. Now, it's not the fact that it's embossed, which I quite like. It's quite nice to know that the PSU that you're buying with your device is produced and at least overseen by the company themselves. But the fact that it's an external PSU and a number of you aren't fans of external PSUs. You think it's easier to accidentally disconnect them, they're dangly, they're awkward for transit if you're moving hardware from location to location and very easy to end up accidentally leaving one of these at one place or another but an external PSU gives two main advantages which for me win the day by a country mile first and foremost it's the idea that this external PSU if it breaks because other than the hard drives it's the most fragile part inside it means that this is easy to replace it's so much easier to replace an external PSU than having to tear down uh, an, an external chassis um, to get to the PSU inside. And also, a number of you won't want to do that in the case of an RMA. And chances are, if you are dealing with the warranty and you need to send something back because, you know, PSUs, they fail like anything else. If that happens, you don't sending back your whole unit can be troublesome. And do you take the drive? Do you send the drives as well? There's so much to do. An external power brick is just easy. This is covered by your warranty. You fire it off, they send you a new one. You can even buy new ones or spares if you want. Secondly, an external PSU reduces heat dramatically inside. Think about that, an external PSU in a system that's on, on for days, weeks, months, or even years at a time, that can generate some heat. So an external power supplier removes the heat internally from the equation. It doesn't generate loads of heat, but it definitely produces heat when mains power is going through one of these. So personally for me, external PSUs all the way. Now if we remove the top layer of the box there, we can take a look inside, because there is our unit. There's nothing more in the box. Quite well partitioned, quite well protected. And again, that has made it over here from Japan and it's looking pretty bulletproof to me. Um, and let's have a little look inside. Remove that tape and see what we get for our money. Right, pop that in there, and there you go. 
that is the DS920 Plus. And again, if you own the 918, what I've just said to you there, they're a bit redundant really for a number of you, because let's face it, apart from this little label down there, the majority of 918 owners are gonna be thinking, well, who cares? Um, because it's the same chassis, and that's absolutely true. This chassis is pretty much the same chassis that we saw uh, unveiled in originally in the 918 series when it first came came out all those years ago. Um, this is the four bay standard chassis that Synology have been using. There's slight tweaks, I think, to the framework of it. It's not quite as deep on the front there. And again, it's gonna be very hard to go through this without the comparison. And we do have the hardware comparison coming soon where you do have the physical 918 and the physical 920 here so side by side. But what I will say is this is probably one of the best um, value versus return chassis I've seen in a long time. I talked about it a number of years ago, but it's worth reiterating once again. Um, for a four bay, so this is four hard drives worth of storage here, ventilation is going to be key because you need air passing all the way through the device. You need to make sure that you've got active and passive cooling systems working together at the same time. You don't want to have to have lots of wires knocking around. You want to make sure everything's in preset locations. And from every time where I've ever, um, you know, removed the framework around one of these NASes, the Synology 4 bay frame like this is probably one of the best we've seen because it does an excellent job of spacing everything out, but not to an inappropriate level or to a point where this will become unsightly large. It's a very compact chassis indeed. In, in fact, if we get a hard drive, we've got a hard drive here, just to give you some idea about the size, that's how big one hard drive is there in front of it it's not that big at all and if you've got a hard drive knocking around you can do most of that scaling for yourself now the device itself uh, as mentioned is a four bay nas but it can be expanded up to nine bays with the connection of the dx517 expansion chassis it supports a number of different raid configurations and for those that aren't aware a raid configuration is when you have multiple hard drives all in one storage area like this one two three four and you want to make sure that you can leverage the advantages of having more than one drive together. And one of the chief ways to do that is RAID, redundant array of independent disks. What that means in real terms is you can either have a system where multiple drives are being read and written to all the time, consequently it improves performance speed overall, or you can create a system where data is written to one giant storage area inside the NAS, but if one of your drives dies, then it doesn't matter because the system will still have a system of uh, blueprints known as parity data inside across the RAID and therefore allowing you to retrieve your data in the in case of a dead drive. Now, parity and RAID are something I could go into a lot more detail about, but I just strongly recommend you check out my video on it. I've done like two or three of them. If you just Google NAS RAID or something, I'm sure you'll find it. But the device itself is a four bay NAS. Not only does it support those standard RAID configurations, but it also supports their own RAID configuration known as SHR, Synology Hybrid RAID. Now, on the face of it, it seems to be enough identical to standard RAID levels. It allows you one disk of drive failure, or in the case of SHR2, two disks. You know, what's the difference between that and RAID 1 and RAID 5 and RAID 6? And technically, on the face of it, it is identically the same for the most part, but with some core differences. The first main difference is with SHR, you can mix and match your drives. Now, on the face of it, there's a number of you that have got a bit of experience in storage that have just heard that and gone, what the what? That's a terrible idea. And you're right, it's not great, but if done right, it can be hugely beneficial. Case in point, you can fully populate this four bay on day one if you choose. You can fully populate it with four TB hard drives, keeping it economical, four TB drives, put four of them in there and you put them in a RAID 5 or an SHR then you would end up with um, da, 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 a 12 TB of storage because one drive has to be dropped for the RAID protection you'll lose one drive's worth of capacity now your system's running fine three four five years down the line but you start to think oh, I need to get some bigger drives I'm running out of space or one of my drives has died now when you want to buy new drives buying four TB again will seem like a bit of a waste. Now, SHR allows you to now install bigger drives. So at that point, all those years later, 10 TB may be incredibly affordable, and you want to start including 10 terabyte disks. So when you do that, 
SHR will allow you to install drives that are larger than the rest of the drives in the RAID configuration and adapt itself internally as you add more drives to give you more storage. Traditional RAID doesn't do that. It doesn't allow you to mix drives. I mean, obviously brands primarily, but mainly capacities. The SHR will allow you to do that. The second advantage of SHR is it's significantly easier to uh, like increase the size of your RAIDed storage pool. You can have an SHR with two disks, and as you add more disks, it is significantly easier to move it up within an SHR because an SHR with two disks and an SHR with five disks is only two clicks of difference when raiding up. Whereas converting from a raid one to a raid five can be a little bit more time consuming and more, appropriate, uh, more importantly, can be very, very difficult. Whereas uh, moving an SHR across two and then more disks really is incredibly straightforward. And for those that are a little bit nervous about that sort of thing, it can be incredibly beneficial. So talking a little bit more about the device again, we can have a look at the front of it. Now we have got at the top there, little LED markers there that denote drive access, system health, network activity, and more with an LED for each of the hard drive bays built into the front. We've got a USB 3, that's USB 3.1 Gen 1, or USB 3.2 Gen 1, or USB 3.0, for Christ's sake, USB, make your minds up. Um, the USB port here is a five gigabits per second USB-A port. Now that is utilized by backups. And once again, I have said before, I'm trying to cover all the bases in this video, so a number of you know what I'm gonna say, but if you don't, thanks for listening. USB backups on a NAS are so easy. Rudimentary, yes, but incredibly easy. With a device like this, you can have an obscene amount of storage. We'll talk about storage capabilities later. But with this device here and this USB port, it opens the door to a localized backup because a NAS isn't a backup per se unless you're using it as such. For example, if you have a bunch of phones, a bunch of tablets, a bunch of PCs, whatever, all sending files and backing up their respective storage areas to this device over the network or the internet, lovely. But the minute you start deleting files off your phone, off your tablet, off your laptop, off your computer, this stops being a backup because it's the only place those files exist. Now it's just a repository of data, which if it's broken, if it's stolen, if there's a flood or a fire or whatever, you've lost that data forever. So this is not a backup if you use it in that second way. One way around that and a more cost-effective way to do that is to utilize USB backups. Now, if we have a look, do we have any USB drives available? No, we don't, that's a pain. Using a simple USB backup drive that are incredibly inexpensive these days in several terabytes, you can create a system where this device backs up itself to a USB or selected folders, files or more onto a USB as soon as the USB is connected to that port. And vice versa, if you utilize a USB regularly in your job or your academic life regularly, you can get home, dump your bag, get the drive out, pop it on the table, connect it via the USB, and then you can set an automated routine so you don't even need to go into the OS that I'll talk about later on. It will just back itself up, streamlined and real easy. So when that happens, you can then go off, make your dinner, watch Netflix, do what you want, and the backup will take place, either the USB to the NAS or the NAS to the USB. In fact, there are multiple ways in which you can back up. First and foremost, standard backup. It just sends the contents of one, to the other, just all the files, bang. After that, you can do differential backups, which is when only the files that change between backups are backed up. So say you backed up this drive, you went away, you wrote another, you know, you made another copy of your dissertation or you took a bunch of photos for work, come back, reconnect it. A differential backup will only back up the new files that have been added to the NAS. And remember that works both ways too. You can create a synchronized backup where a folder on this device or a folder on both devices even are identical every time they're connected. So if anything changes, they can be reset. And the third backup you can do is time manage backups where you connect the drive and then every single time it runs the backup routine, it creates a brand new copy each time in a different folder over time, which is incredibly useful for those out there that do testing and need something more like a snapshot 
of different days of synchronized backups. So there are lots of ways in which you can store on a NAS, but the USB port on the front, people seem to largely overlook it as something other than uh, a fluff gathering device, but it's incredibly useful and a very inexpensive way to create another tier to your backup strategy. So if we have a look at the front of the device, We've got our trays. Now these are click and load, three and a half inch trays. There's also screw holes for two and a half inch drive media there. And this is a SATA device. Installing a drive inside this is incredibly easy. So you can click off one side, click off the other side. There we go there. Helps if you have fingernails. You then get your hard drive, pop your hard drive inside, simple as. Pop the clips back on. Other clip, and there you go, simple as. And then you can install that in there, make sure it's SATA port, port out, slide it in, and that's it, you've installed your hard drive. You can lock it, of course, there's the locks there on the bottom that we talked about earlier on. Um, but it really is that straightforward to install drives. And remember, you don't need to fully populate this device in order to utilize it for the first time. You only need one hard drive to run it. You could run this device now on that single hard drive. You wouldn't have any real redundancy in case of that drive failing, and you want to utilize some of the backup means, be it utilizing USB or using cloud managed backups with hyper backup um, or active backup suite. That's another thing that we'll talk about later on. But the um the hard drive support on this device is pretty extensive modern hard drives now such as the seagate iron wolf nas series arriving at 16 terabytes it's not a cheap drive at 450 to 500 nicker but it's still one of the best drives out there in terms of overall capacity for nas we're starting to see 18 terabyte drives slowly put their head up and then climb back under but these are incredibly data center class drives which may not be ideal for a device like this now if we remove that drive, we can take a look at the rest of them inside there. If we remove all four drays, and again, as mentioned, you don't need to fully populate this. You can populate it with a single hard drive, and then you can add drives gradually if you want to scale your cost. So maybe start with two in a RAID 1 or an SHR, and then add drives gradually as you go. Now, if we look on the inside of this device, we can take a good look at how ventilation is sat on this. So at the rear, you've got that blue PCB, and on there, you've got a SATA bay for each of them. No loose cables for power. These are dual data and power ports there. If we look at the other side, on the inside there, which is going to be a lot harder to show you with this light, you can see that ventilation there. Now, on here, we have got the Synology logo on either side. And that Synology logo there assists the active fans at the rear that we'll talk about in a bit with some nice passive airflow. There's lots of means in which air works around the drives but and on the base of it, of course, but it's on the side of the device, that really nice logo for passive cooling that I've always been impressed by. Um, but one thing I'm less impressed by that we will definitely talk about later in the video is that memory bay. Now, as you see there, there is a sodium memory bay there. Now, we're gonna talk more about that later on, but the 918 had two sodium memory bays here inside the device. There was two of them in an L formation, both of which supported four gig each. This is a single sodium slot that is designed for a four gig Synology memory module. Right, there you go. So a standard Synology module, and that's a four gig stick. And again, it retails around 70 to 90 pounds. So it's quite steep, but it is their own memory. It's 2,666 megahertz. Installing the memory is incredibly straightforward. All you do is make sure it's face up. I'll bring that closer to the camera. In there, pop the memory module inside and then angle it down and it'll click. And there you go, that's that memory module. And now this has gone from a four gig device to an eight gig device. That is just how easy it is to upgrade memory on these devices. There's runners there for each of the individual hard drive bays. So in terms of overall construction, it gives you a very simplistic looking design, but it's really the software and the hardware inside that carry this device forward. It doesn't need to be overly complex. The technology has moved forward so much over the years that this is what it's become now, a much more streamlined, compact and efficient device. 
because you don't want lots of bits knocking around because that generates heat. It can generate noise and ultimately make it very unpleasant to be around and detrimental to the efficiency and ability of the internal components. Now, if we look at the rear of the device, sorry, the base of the device, we can see some ventilation here for the side controller board that's got that memory module as well as the CPU as well. But another cool thing we need to discuss is this. These are the two NVMe SSD caching bays. Now this is something that originally premiered on the DS918. It was the ability to not only have four hard drive bays in their own RAID giving you performance improvements in some RAID configurations, but also allowed you to install NVMe SSDs. These would be utilized to kind of act as caching and buffering to the storage array. So to put it another way, if you were to populate this with just SSDs, your performance would be insane, given standard SATA SSDs give you about 500 megabytes each. And if you put them in, I don't know, a RAID 5 array, they would give an improvement per SSD of around 150 to 250 megabytes per second, incrementally with each added SSD, based on the CPU inside, there's a few other factors. Remember, that's internal speeds only. With hard drives, the average hard drive will give you somewhere between 150 and 250, 260. More enterprise level drives, you know, in con you know, enterprise construction above 10 TB and 7200 RPM and larger cache, they'll give you that 200 to 250, 60. And as you add more drives in the RAID, it'll increase your RAID configure uh, your RAID speed by about 50 to 100 or so megabytes per added drive. So you add that all up and get your overall speed. Now, the SSDs are obviously faster, great but with inherent downsides. One, wow, they expensive. Around five to seven times more expensive, depending on the drives you go for, and with a cap. Currently, the largest commercial, you know, consumer SSD for SATA is four terabytes. With eight terabytes, thanks to quad layer NAND, uh, quad layer cell NAND becoming available. So even at four TB, it's expensive still, and four TB inside this, a four TB hard drive is way, way, way less to buy. So the middle ground is hybrid level storage. That's when you have all your hard drives in there and you have two NVMe SSDs in there at around 10% of the overall hard drive capacity. So 10 terabytes have one terabyte of SSD and these will assist the hard drive array in terms of those read and writes. They'll keep things moving. They'll act as a kind of buffer zone for files to be handed to and from. More frequently accessed files can be moved over to them. But again, uh, the, uh, the cache can often be flushed, but not in the same way memory is. And installing an SSD is incredibly straightforward. This is the new Ironwall 510s. These are the NVMe SSDs uh, for NAS. And installing an NVMe is incredibly straightforward. You don't even need a screwdriver again. Remove a panel, remove a panel, get your NVMe SSD, make sure it's label face up. Make sure you double check the key at the top because you will need an NVMe M2 SSD, the NVMe bit is very important. Put it into the slot, there's a little clip there, push the clip, and that's it. The NVMe is now installed inside that device. And again, very easy to do. Pop another one in, pop that inside, move the clip, bang, two NVMe's installed. Actually quicker than it took me to upgrade the memory. Now. It's worth highlighting that you don't need to install two. You can install a single SSD if you choose. The reason you might install two is to take advantage of a different kind of caching. You have um, read-only caching. You technically have write-only caching these days. I think DSM-7 is going to be smoothing that out. And you have read-write caching, the most popular, that actually works in both ways with regards to buffering the hard drive area. You can compare those to a RAID 0 of melding the drives together for read or write-only caching. And read-write caching is a RAID 1 environment with two SSDs. So... In the improvements of SSDs, uh, the NVMe SSD caching in this has been noted before. We'll of course be doing a performance benchmark on this. We've already done one for the DS720 that should be going live in a few days. But ultimately with this device, when it comes to the hard drive and SSD array, it's more beneficial in a four base scenario uh, than it was in a two, just because you've got a lot more speed potential with those hard drives in conjunction with those SSDs when having a larger hard drive array. Two hard drives and two SSD, as we found in the 720, has its limitations by comparison. Now, 
it would be remiss of me before we even go any further after all of this talk about um, NVMe SSD caching without discussing the moderate elephant in the room. Those one GBE ports there at the bottom. Now, this device, when it was first announced, a number of you felt not dissimilar to myself when we learned it was going to be one gigabit Ethernet, which was a bit of a kick to the stomach because we kind of assumed Synology in this gen would go 2.5 GBE at the very least. NVMe SSD performance benefits, uh, increased memory, that great CPU that we've not even talked about yet inside, enterprise level hard drives, enterprise level SSDs, all of that adds to a huge amount of performance possible. But all of that performance is internal. So if you're running VMs, if you're running a surveillance setup, if you're running a Plex Media Server, if you're running things that are inside the NAS when they're operating and rendering and what you are seeing is a browser-based interface of that, you will see the benefit. But because of the rear ports, it is a bit of a bottleneck. There are two one gigabit ethernet ports there. Now don't get me wrong, you can link aggregate or port trunk or load balance to a lesser degree. This allows you to combine those one GBE ports at 100 or so megs each and combine them into two gigabit ethernet. So in other words, around 200 or so megabytes per second. But even then, that's still a bit of a limiter. You heard what I said about one of these drives surpassing 200 megabytes on its own. So the 1GBE ports on this are still incredibly beneficial. And with the majority of the hardware in your environment now or in the years to come are not going to be 2.5 GBE, 5 GBE or 10 GBE enabled, you may not even take advantage of this. But it's worth highlighting that if you connect this device to a switch or your internet service provider route, RSP, if you connect that with one or two gigabit ethernet ports, you have to understand that every device that's communicating with the NAS is sharing that connection. So if you connect this with one GBE and you connect this and five people connect with it at the same time, they will only get a maximum throughput unless you tinker with the priority settings. 20 megabytes per second each because they'll be sharing it now that's only if they're simultaneously accessing and if all of them are utilizing the full bandwidth they can potentially do i mean you can assign priority to devices in the home or office environment you can do lots of things within the software but there's still no avoiding that's a huge amount of throughput internal potential that is getting bottlenecked in a scenario where you may have multiple devices now there may be people watching this going who cares everything i own is one gbe anyway and that's a very good point but more internet service providers are considering 2.5 gbe now particularly in the rise of wi-fi 6 to a number of commercial devices and devices we use in the home for something as simple as multimedia are getting to a point with 4k and 1080p and incredibly dense codecs out there that the media we're watching is taking a lot of bandwidth and although most of it won't fill an entire 1 gbe connection some of them are becoming very damn close. And when you look at some of the high dense, like 8K, 8K and stuff like that, which doesn't really gear towards this 4K enabled box, 1GBE, there's still no avoiding that it is a little bit of a disappointment. This price point is still pretty good, um, particularly in comparison to the 918 and the improvements, the fact that they're hopefully keeping those prices as close together as possible. But 1GBE is still something that I know a number of you were not hoping for and unfortunately have um, seen. So what else have we got going on on the rear of this device? Well, we have got another USB port there and it's worth highlighting those USB ports don't just support external storage. They can be utilized for other things, um, wireless dongles. They can be utilized for printers, UPSs. There are actually quite a lot of USB devices supported by Synology, but none of them in the traditional KVM, uh, so keyboard video mouse setup or to be utilized in anything more than a add-on to this device to use. Very, This device will always remain the, the host with everything else, a low scale client, so bear that in mind. There's the eSATA port that we talked about earlier on that allowed you to add another five bays of storage to this device. And again, why would you do that? Well, four bays of storage is great, particularly in light of the larger generation of drives that are out there these days, but, Four bays can fill up real quick. And again, if you look at 1080p, 4K, 8K media and more, we're starting to see some files are just Herculean in their size. If you're backing up games from your PC rig, then chances are that you're going to be utilizing a lot of bandwidth. 
I mean, if you looked at games like GTA 5 recently, that game is super old, and with all those DLCs, it is massive. What I'm saying is, if you're running a device like this for backing up a standard system rig with all of your files, chances are you're going to run out of space eventually. And the idea of expandability to add another five bays of storage to this device can be opportunistic. You know, you are talking about, by the time you need it, even bigger drives out there to have. Yes, the expansion is JBOD, so the RAID is handled by the device. And yes, the expansion itself does require a commitment of around 400 odd quid to buy that. But the expandability um, a later date allows you to, you know, leverage your budget accordingly now towards a four bay that gives you the ability to add drives later on. I know a number of you would just go straight for an eight bay with a RAID 6, bang, straight off the dot. And I get that, but not everyone is like that. So it's nice to have that choice early doors. And that's about it, really. We've got those rear mounted fans there, and they can be set automatically or manually for their RPM to adjust accordingly, increasing and decreasing as needed. And again, if noise is a factor, which it really isn't on a device like this, it's pretty quiet. Um, you can lower those RP, uh, the RPN of those fans manually. Um, talking of um, kind of environmental stuff in your home or office environment, I didn't really mention the LEDs can also be dimmed as well. So all the LEDs on the drives and the system can be lowered to absolute zero or made as bright as possible. Now, I mentioned noise. Let's talk about noise for a second. This isn't a very noisy device. I think it's like 19 dBA. I'm sure it was on the screen at the beginning. And again, I've been running... Um, not this device, but I've got a few of the new Synologies running simultaneously, and you can't really hear them right now, and they're only about two meters that way, so they're quite quiet. But what you need to bear in mind is more enterprise-level hard drives produce more noise. For those of you that um, are coming at very, um, in the next week or so, you're going to be watching a lot of software videos about the brand new series of Synologies. A lot of the time, I've purposefully kept the mics very close to the NASes when I've done boot up cycles when we've been testing different things. And the reason I've done that is so you can sound, you can hear the difference between bog standard, I say bog standard, that's so um, so critical. I mean, standard series drives, you know, up to about six, maybe eight TB these, these days that just don't make much noise. And then you go higher than that. These drives are bigger, They're particularly the helium sealed drives. There's just a lot more going on inside and you hear it a lot more audibly, you know, even a meter away from the device. So a lot of the time, the NAS can't really do anything about that noise because it's the drives. So make sure if you're sensitive about noise to in look into the noise of drives before you buy them. Now, carrying on the subject of hardware, we can talk about the internal hardware of this device. We've already talked about the memory that we're going to touch on uh, again a bit soon, and we've talked about the NVMe SSD caching. All of that means nothing if you don't have a good CPU inside to take care of things. And I'm pleased to say the CPU inside this, I'm already pretty pleased with early doors in the, t in the times I've experimented with it. That is the Intel Celera on the J4125. Uh, it's a four core 2.0 gigahertz processor that can be burst up to 2.7 gigahertz per core. It also opens the door to DDR4. So with the DDR4 memory that this arrives with four gig of that can be upgraded, uh, that is um, Synology's own 2000 and 666 megahertz sodium non-ECC memory. So let's go through it. The CPU is definitely a jump from its predecessor, that was the J3455, and that CPU was 1.5 to 2.3 gigahertz uh, when burst, and that was a four core CPU too. It also arrived with four gig of memory, that was DDR3L at 1,866 megahertz. So it is a jump up, and in almost every single regard, this new CPU outperforms its predecessor, apart from 8 and 10 bit H.264 decoding, but we're encode decode. We'll talk about that in our Plex video soon. Um, now, on this device, that CPU opens the door to a number of things. Thanks to um, UHD Graphics 600, it means that you can take advantage of 4K as well as 1080p transcoding. It can play back um, the majority of 1080p and 4K files, but transcoding, you will see differing performance overall. You'll certainly see the difference in native performance versus Plex performance uh, and transcoding particularly. Even if you allow Plex Media Server to take advantage of the hardware transcoding engine. You know, you've got a Plex Pass and you've let the, your server have uh, access to that facility. It still won't be as good. Now, there 
is a little bit of confliction at the moment. We're sort of working in the background on some stuff that was coming out last year. And again, uh, and Takeo, uh, who helped us with the 920 review a few weeks ago, going through some stuff there about um, how to improve performance in terms of transcoding in Plex Media Server. We're finding out something about drivers that we can disable. I'll save that for another uh, video, but the vanilla device here with no, no change in via SSH or anything like that, this device does perform very well in Plex. We're really looking forward to seeing how it compares with both our videos with the DS220 Plus that went live last week, I believe, and how it compares with the 918 Plus and the 1019 Plus. The reason being that this is supposed to be the follow-up to the 918, and a number of you bought that box because of its affordability as a Plex media server. I will say that I think it's going to perform admirably, admirably well in Plex Media Server for what you know the money you're paying. But remember, this isn't an Intel Core. This isn't like a Pentium that we saw in an R16. This is still going to be a Celeron processor. And I know a number of you were kind of hoping they'd go down the Celeron route. I didn't think they'd ever do that because of the family and the series and the way they run these devices uh, within their product families. But still, now. The four gig of memory that this arrives with is a lovely little starting point. Four gig is, to me, should be the standard these days. We're seeing more and more NASes coming out with two gig, and I don't quite understand why. Four gig may seem a bit extravagant uh, from a manufacturer's stance, but from a user's stance, given that you normally lose up to a gig of your memory for the system running at its very best without all the individual apps earmarking their own memory, I'd say that this device arriving with four gig is a lovely amount to start with. That four core CPU allows you to take advantage of things like Docker and uh, Synology's Virtual Machine Manager a great deal better than some of the dual core variants of this because you need to allocate storage and memory in advance of those VMs and container environments. Another thing is Synology's DSM platform and the way it manages caching in the background. It does an incredible job of um, kind of harnessing the total amount of memory available, using a little bit extra, if anything, when it's not being used. And when an app comes along that needs the memory, the speed at which it flushes uh, the utilization of the memory at DSM to hand those uh, resources over to the apps is really impressive. It's a very interesting uh, viewpoint. If you look at the resource monitor, do check that out. Um, in terms of the applications that this thing can run, anything from Synology, this largely runs it. Notwithstanding the fact that it, its file system is BTRFS, uh, you can run it on ext4 if you like, but thanks to the support of the BTRFS file system, you've got things like uh, background snapshots to be created with a far lesser uh, impact on your hardware resources. So those that like to keep records of storage images so they can revert if need be, that's very beneficial. On top of that, um, faster recreation of shared folders. So if you have a shared folder and you want to duplicate it a bunch of times for your connected users, or if you've got staff and user groups and stuff like that, so much easier. Uh, on top of that, you've got file self-healing where uh, checksums are created before and at the end of transmissions. So if there is an irregularity and avoidance of things like bit rot, it can do the file self-healing. There's a lot of stuff that BTRS brings to the BTRFS brings to the table and a number of the apps that this device supports in largely the entire catalog of the Synology DSM library. Are to, a lot of them take advantage of BTRFS and others insist that you have it running. So what have you got? Well, for those of you that have never used a Synology NAS, it's worth highlighting that a number of the apps from Synology are designed to replace apps that you're already paying for. The reason being that if you are using a Synology app with a Synology system with your data, then it utilizes less resources. Their applications have been tweaked and uh, you know evolved and updated regularly to be the best they can be within this storage environment. Case in point, and the examples I generally always give, are comparing some of the cloud-managed apps that we use these days and the Synology alternatives. So if you use Skype or WhatsApp for your family and colleagues and friends to communicate, you can use Synology Chat, which allows you to create multiple users, all with accounts, all within the system that can communicate. All the data still stays within the system, not the internet or the cloud, within the system. There's mobile apps, desktop apps, you can communicate messages, send files, send links, do to-do lists. It's just like those other chat platforms. If 
you want to utilize for example a storage area that is a shared storage area that's one portal access point like the likes of google drive or dropbox you've got that in this device utilizing google i'm uh, sorry um synology drive synology drive um, allows you to have a one portal access point as an alternative to google drive and dropbox and and, and more allowing you to see all of your folder structure open files be they documents be they videos be they photos directly from that web browser without having to go through different apps or any other kind of file means sonology drive also supports local file pinning and file streaming and again i know you're hearing file streaming well i stream movies all the time it's more than that it allows you to create a folder on your desktop where you can have files that live on the nas and you can see shadows of those files and then either pin them do you want them permanently to live on your system or only accessed when you want to access them and therefore they don't take up any room on your system but you can still see all the files all the structure and you can pin them or stream them locally or just go like 30 days i want that and little more and the intelligent background caching will know the files that you use the most it's very very cool um, and there's also applications such as surveillance station that allows you to attach multiple ip cameras in your home or office environment and have a enterprise level surveillance platform with pan tilt zoom with um simultaneous record and playback um intelligent timeline scanning alerts to your phone alerts to your email so many features and functionality of modern ip cameras such a um, smart AI support and motion detection and light support and heat detection all of these things can be facilitated into the Synology NAS to create a surveillance platform if multimedia is what you want to go for the Synology 920 a lot of right with support of photo station and Synology moments photo station for photographers a great app for those of you that have photo collections and portfolios and want to learn intrinsic details about your photos or you've got um, Synology Moments that allows you to use AI powered search tools and AI um, powered recognition to go through decades of photos and then identify people, places, things, subjects, and then you can search your albums using intelligent search terms. Don't search for image 36920903, search for beach, tree, drink, food, dog, cat, whatever that you can search them and it will find them and produce those photos for you. The same with the facial recognition too. And it would continue cataloging as you add more photos, allowing you to take advantage of smart tagging features that Google Photos and Facebook have on your own local network storage, not the internet, local storage. Cut the ties. That's what we're saying here. If it's music, you've got audio um, station and along with that, you've got other iTunes server and other applications built in with DSM's App Center for you to create very unique and customizable audio areas which you can then pick up that audio over the internet or the network on smart Sonos devices or Amazon Alexa and Amazon Fire Stick with dedicated Synology apps available from the Amazon Fire Stick platform and from Amazon Alexa, the only NAS brand that has them as well. Um, allowing you to access your files with voice recognition off the NAS locally. So there's so much open to you. We haven't even talked about video. We talked about Plex Media Server, which runs on this, you know, pretty damn good. On top of that, you've got their own app, Video Station, which for all intents and purposes is better than Plex. And that is a point I'm prepared to stand behind in a video coming very, very soon where we compare them because it takes advantage of the system resources and gives you everything Plex does without the bloatware without the extra stuff that you don't want or need and most importantly without a subscription plex requires that subscription for a plex pass yeah sure you got the free one but you can't take advantage of hardware transcoding without it this video station the transcoding all of that the um metadata scraping from imdb rotten tomatoes trailers cast lists and thumbnails all included what i'm saying is this is a contained package in terms of software. If you're a business user, Virtual Machine Manager Container Station, along with 
Synology Office, Synology uh, Calendar, Synology Mail, Mail Station, all of these applications to replace the tools that you already use in your office environment that rely on cloud connections, cloud subscriptions, and ultimately monthly payments go away because this has it all included in that one payment you pay at the beginning of five to six hundred nicker. It's that straightforward. Is it perfect? Is it hell? There is, of course, nothing perfect. The um, uh, surveillance platform, after two cameras, you've got to buy more camera licenses. The reason being, their platform, it's subsidized by surveillance use. So you only get two cameras included to be supported, but it supports up to 40, and you will need to buy licenses for those extra cameras, which isn't perfect. The CPU isn't perfect to Plex Media Server, which I know will rub some of your noses out of joint. And ultimately, its ability is only limited by the fact of that CPU being a Celeron. It's still a great CPU, and the one GB on the back is a bit of a pain, but overall, it is a good NAS and 920. If you have been waiting on buying a powerhouse Synology 4 bay and you weren't quite convinced by the an arm on it and you were thinking, well, I'll hold out a bit, this is a great alternative because it brings a lot to the table. It brings all of the software resources from Synology. It brings a lot of hardware that has been heavily researched over time and it brings it all together in a single purchase option that doesn't try to throttle you with additional payments afterwards like some cloud providers. The only thing at the moment for us to figure out now is, does this device live in your home for three to five years? Does it have the longevity? Because the 918, if you own, if you own the 918 right now, should you be considering this NAS? Probably not. If you're an existing Nominate user, this to me is not a big enough upgrade to you know, result in selling up and going for this bad boy. They're very similar, but if you've already owned the 918 for a year or two, stick with it. There may be something better along the way. But if you were looking at the best 4-bay that Synology put out for a while, you're looking at it. It is a good NAS. It is a combined, complete solution, and I do recommend it. I look forward to telling you more about this in all of our software overviews very, very soon. And if there's anything I've missed in this video, do stay tuned for all of the follow-ups. We're going to be looking at VMs. We're going to be looking at cache performance. We are certainly going to be looking at Plex Media Server and Video Station. And if you've got any other recommendations moving forward, put it in the comments. But thank you so much for watching. There is a full review in the description to NASCompares.com. A lot more detail in there than I've gone through today. And this has really gone on, hasn't it? Um, if you do want to learn more, always click subscribe. I do these videos quite regularly and I will keep you informed. Click like if you've enjoyed this video. And of course, there are more links in the description for the best places to get hold of your, 9, your 920+. Plus. I'll see you next time.